Welcome to the Back Hope Summit. I'm Fiona Truman, your host and fellow traveler on the road to health and freedom from pain. There is hope, and you're about to discover new possibilities of finding it. Congratulations on taking this next step in your journey. Today we're very lucky to be speaking with Ryan Crane. Now, Ryan has been helping chronic pain sufferers for a number of years. He helps them address and eliminate their recurring body aches with something called the Crane Training Method. Now, this program was designed after years with working with clients who were tormented by various pains. It includes methods needed to move better, feel better and live better. Ryan also creates custom tailored programs to fit clients' needs and lifestyles and to improve their quality of life. Ryan, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Ryan, I love this move better, feel better, live better. That's very welcoming. How did you get involved with this, Ryan? What started you off? How I got involved in corrective exercise was... About five years ago, I was working in personal training and looking at my clientele, the population, that so many of my clients were suffering from injuries, aches and pains, and were always complaining of you know, some sort of either injury or really limiting their athletic performance. And I really wanted to take a step back and develop programs to help these people move better, feel better and live better. So you were actually training people. Is this in sport? Yeah, I was doing a lot with people in sports, primarily in tennis and golf. And now I've got my practice is built out where I've got a lot of people that work in corporate America, successful executives who work 70 to 80 hours a plus a week and are suffering from aches and pains, and then they go out on the weekend, and they're a weekend warrior, and then they hurt themselves, and then they come see me early in the week, and we get their body in alignment and prepared for exercise. Right, weekend warrior. That's a phrase that we all know. I suppose in some ways we put our bodies, all of us, all of us put our bodies under a lot of stress, stresses and strains, don't we? We do. Yeah. So we have the executive who sits at a desk for 80 hours a week, but it doesn't actually matter whether you're an executive or or a menial clerk, really, does it? No. Menial sounds, that sounds awful, but what I mean is you're sitting there working at a desk, whatever you're doing, if you're sat there and you're doing repetitive work, you're putting your body under the same stresses, aren't you? Yeah, that's exactly where our society is. People are working longer hours. People are more sedentary. People are moving less. And as a resort, that's creating a lot of muscle imbalances, movement compensations, injuries, aches and pains. And it's causing a lot of people to have much more injuries. Yeah. I presume it's worse to sit at a desk Monday to Friday and then rush out at the weekend and try and do something very physical. Well, you're exactly right, because think about it. When we sit anywhere, all of our muscles are essentially asleep. And when you go out and do something physical like play tennis or golf, you're asking all those muscles that were asleep to now wake up, participate, and be used in a functional activity. And for people who are deconditioned, that's very challenging. So our normal modern lifestyle is deconditioning us. Exactly. Sitting at a desk is deconditioning our muscles, deconditioning our spine, and as a result, people are developing an assortment of aches and pains, and that's why lower back pain is the second most common reason people go to the doctor and affects 80% of our population. Mm, This comes up time and time and time again, that most people at some point in their lives will suffer from back pain, and what we're saying is that daily life that we can't really change, can we? If we have a desk job, if we have a checkout person is going to be sat there and there's very little movement involved, just the repetition of twisting to one side all the time. It's putting a lot of strain on the body because we're deconditioned. Is that right? It is, yeah. I give 
my followers and clients tools and strategies that they can use throughout their workday and week to eliminate the aches and pains that they're getting, particularly in the lower back, stimulate productivity, and enhance their overall energy at work. So it is possible, but the extended periods of sitting are really creating havoc on uh, our bodies. Right, but that's a good point then, because most of us can't actually change what we do. But you can help counteract some of the deconditioning that is taking place during our daily working life. That's correct, yes. That's brilliant. What are the telltale signs that people should be looking for? You know, that something might be becoming a problem. Uh, Some of the telltale signs that I see are reduced productivity at work, fatigue, decreased performance if they are participating in a particular sport, loss of appetite, and the increased ability to complain of of an ache or a pain. Usually it starts of just a little bit of lower back pain. It may hang around for two, three days, and they continue and they push further, and the problem gets exacerbated, and before you know it, it's something more chronic or serious and long-term. So we might be saying then that if somebody's feeling more fatigued at work than they should be and they've got a little bit of a a backache which doesn't have to be anything major at this stage that this might be their body's way of alerting them to the fact that they could do with some help here exactly yes okay so say somebody comes to you at that point they've been recommended to come with you because they've heard that you have a corrective exercise program What would you do with someone who comes to an appointment with you? Well, this is a very thorough and detailed process that I take them through. But first thing I do is I like to schedule a phone call with them where I can learn a little bit about them via phone. After we set up our initial phone call, I send them an evaluation form. uh, And on the evaluation form, it essentially asks for their goals, their lifestyle, their occupation, their prior injuries, if they've had any surgeries. And, you know, this background evaluation form is critical because it teaches me a little bit more about their lifestyle and their bodies. That's the first step that we do. After I review and analyze their evaluation form, they come to see me for a dynamic postural assessment. And when I'm participating in the assessment, I have the evaluation form in place and it enables me to use the evaluation form as a reference point to come back to should we have any questions or uncertainties. Right. Now, one of the things that you said there that I found interesting, dynamic postural assessment. This is one of the things that keeps coming up and up and up, that we don't realize how we're standing, how we're sitting, how we're moving. How do you do this dynamic postural assessment? Is this something that, you know, I could do for myself now with your guidance, looking in a mirror, for example? Yeah, if you know what to look for, there are certain checkpoints in the body that obviously I'm trained and looking for. People do call me a detective because I'm looking for imbalances, movement compensations, deficiencies that are putting more stress and havoc on our body and creating additional aches and pains. Right. So movement compensations, what does that mean? Movement compensation is your body moving in a dynamic fashion out of alignment. That could be walking, jumping, running, climbing. And if you're doing it out of alignment or with improper technique, you're putting additional stress and strain on the entire body. So would this be, for example, you'll see a row of school children standing there and some of them will be sort of splayed. They'll have, you know, their feet splayed, duck footed, or they'll have their toes pointing towards each other. And that's the pigeon toed, isn't it? Yes. So this is the type of thing that we're looking for, is it? I mean, those are obvious examples. When you do your detective work, I presume that you can see things that would perhaps not be visible to us untrained people. Exactly. Well, I'm doing a static assessment, which is having the client stand there with their shoes off and watching how their body is performing just in a static standing position. From there, I'll have them perform a dynamic movement assessment where their body is 
moving, and the objective there is to look for balance, neuromuscular efficiency, total body strength, total body flexibility, and seeing how their body works as an integrated unit. Okay, so there's a couple of things I'd like to go over with you there, but can we just go back to this movement compensation? Is this, for example, if somebody is standing in a duck-footed position, is that putting a strain on another area of the body? And that's what you mean by movement compensation. Yes. What you know, One thing I'd like to address and, and hammer the point in is the science has changed in movement and performance in the last 10 years. And what a lot of my clients and followers don't realize is everything in the body is connected. If one part of the body is out of alignment, that's going to affect the rest of the body. So you use the example of duck feet. And if you have duck feet or flat feet, a lot of people know it as flat feet. That's going to affect your knees, your lower back, your hip, and even into your shoulder complex. And I have a few people that have headaches as a result of flat feet. Oh, let's just go back to this. You've known people with headaches as a result of flat feet. Wow. Yeah. Headaches and a few of the tennis players I work with have uh, an assortment of shoulder injuries from flat feet. Okay. Yes, I'm a little bit taken aback by that. We know that everything is connected. What's that song that they used to sing, that the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, etc., etc.? It really is very, very true, isn't it? If you can have a headache because of something that is going on right at the other end of your body. It's exactly it. And I can take you through the process of how it works if you'd like me to. I'd love you to, Ryan. Yes, please do. Yeah, so essentially what happens is people have flat feet, and that's usually a lot of people understand it as overpronation. And overpronation is when your feet collapse too far inward. And what happens is, is as overpronation develops, the lower leg is turned inward as well. And as a result of the repetitive stress and load, now we're getting knee pain. And that's coming from overpronation. Now we're going to take it all the way up through the head and neck. So now the, the knee, the lower leg is turning inward, which is causing an assortment of knee pain and whether it's patellofemoral syndrome. I'm, I'm sorry, could you just explain that? Yeah. So let me back up again. So if one has flat feet, they overpronate and that's when the foot collapses too far inward. When the foot collapses too far inward, it brings the legs on both sides internally, and that's what's called internal rotation. And as a result of the internal rotation, the individual is now suffering from their body out of alignment and they're putting more stress on their knees. And over the long run, that's increasing ACL injuries, which is a very serious, because sometimes career-ending injury to the knee. So as we move up the body, as we get to the hip, as a result of the overpronation, now the hips are turning inward. So we're getting also that internal rotation at the hip and it's causing our lower back to arch. And this is a very common concept that I'm about to share. It's called the anterior pelvic tilt. And you may have heard of that before. It's, it's pretty common nowadays. And essentially the anterior pelvic tilt is an excessive lumbar lordosis or excessive lower back arch. Yes, I think a lot of people have heard of that one, haven't they? It's really prevalent in the working population. People that sit a lot are very susceptible to having an anterior pelvic tilt. And there is a strong correlation between flat feet and overpronation in an anterior pelvic tilt. So now the individual has an excessive curvature in their lower back, and now they're really complaining of lower back pain. Now you get this individual trying to go perform a functional activity like swinging a golf club or even picking up their younger child and they're going to immediately complain of lower back pain. So, but if we think about it, the root cause of the problem is not their back. It's coming from their feet. So if we can fix their feet, that's going to keep their knee in alignment. It's going to keep their hip in alignment. And if their hip is in alignment, their lower back pain is going to be non-existent. Wow. Yes, because you don't think my back hurts, I must look at my feet. 
not when you have no training in this. Right, just something that occurred to me now. Um, can people do a little bit of their own detective work? For example, can they look to see how they wear their shoes down, for example, to see if there is something that's not quite balanced? Yeah, some of the cues that I give my clients who obviously are not trained in this is make sure everything is facing forward. And that starts, we'll start from the feet and move all the way up to the head and neck. And whether you're standing or sitting, you want your feet facing forward, your knees lining up over your second and third toe, and your hips facing forward. And that's even just having a simple gauge and checkpoint like that helps a number of people who are out of alignment by their foot is facing out or in. They're standing all on one leg. They don't have their weight evenly distributed. This puts all kind of stress and strain on our bodies. Okay, so what we can do then is let's go through this because it, this is one of those simple little things that people can do whenever they think about it. And the more they think about it, the more they'll do it. The more they do it, the more it becomes second nature. So these are very small adjustments that can have big effects, aren't they? Exactly. So I'm sitting in the chair, I'm talking to you, but if I were sat at my desk at my normal place of work, I need to make sure, now I think the phrase he used was everything is facing forwards. Exactly. So my feet are straight and my knees need to be lined up with around the second or the third toe. Correct. And I then need to make sure that my hips are in line with my knees. Correct. So then I move up the body, making sure that everything is straight and facing forwards. Now, I don't have to sit stiffly at all, do I, when I'm doing that? No, we want you to sit up nice and tall and straight because this, particularly if we're talking about sitting in a chair, uh, a lot of people are susceptible to rounding their shoulders forward. And a lot of people do this because of laziness. And this comes from an anterior pelvic tilt, which in turn creates curvature in the upper back, which is commonly referred to as rounded shoulders, which puts an assortment of stress on our head and neck and creates an assortment of headaches and imbalances in the upper back and uh, head and neck area. Yes, Brian, something that just occurred to me then, I'm talking about people sat at work, but nowadays we see a lot of children slumped in front of a computer don't we and their shoulders are rounded playing computer games they're not out playing basketball or or football or any of the other physical games so when should parents be looking at their children and thinking there's a problem being set up here well you bring up an interesting point because I do have people in my practice who are children, and, and what I'm noticing is the children are more deconditioned than their parents. And this is a result of most kids nowadays are not exercising as much. More kids are obese, and the technology has advanced. So more people are playing with iPhones, iPads, video games, and having play dates and social activities centered around video games compared to going out and playing basketball or frisbee or playing soccer with their friends or playing any type of game in the street. You know, now more kids are, are moving less. And as a result of the technological advancements, that's putting more stress and strain on the kids, which has uh, been a big problem. That is very worrying, isn't it? Because if you're seeing more and more children with problems, what are they going to be like as adults? It's probably going to be worse because uh, these children are so heavily invested in technology now that when they get to either college or their professional careers, they already have had 10 years of unhealthy habits that they're going to be having problems much, much earlier in, in our life. Yes, because if somebody's had a problem, if it's gone on for 20 years, it is more difficult and more work to change that than something that has only just sort of started to form, isn't it? Yeah, that's why I see most of their parents who are between the ages of 45 and 70 are in sometimes better shape than their kids who are between the ages of 10 and 20 because of the lack of exercise. That is a very sad indictment of today's society, isn't it? No, oh, it's frustrating for me, but it's terrible news now. Um, Ryan... Is this ever normal? You're saying that, you know, you've got parents, elderly parents, older parents that are in better shape than their kids. But if you get to age 70, 
do you have to expect that you're going to have trouble with your knees or your hips or your back or your shoulders? Is that just something that comes with getting older or, or would you say not? Well, uh, it's a good question because I do have a few elder clients who are in condition through regular exercise. However, they've moved inefficiently and out of alignment for a number of years. So those people are experiencing aches and pains that wasn't troubling them in their earlier years in the 30s and 40s, but now it's catching up to them in their 70s. So what I'm seeing is more people in the senior elder population are not as experiencing minor aches and pains, but as a result of not fixing their muscle imbalances, their movement compensations, they're having to get more serious surgical procedures like knee or hip replacements, which is much, much more common in the senior population. Is anybody ever too old for you to help? No, I have a, a few people in their late 80s, which is fabulous that they're dedicated and motivated to take care of their body at this age. That's good news. We've talked, obviously, now about the problems that can occur from youngsters to elderly people. So much of it is going to be based on posture and how we move. Now, you will look at these things. Now, I'm still intrigued by this idea of having back pain because you've got flat feet. What do you do with people when you spot these problems? How do you go about correcting them? This is just a great question and uh, something I'd like to address and make sure people are really clear on. So when I have them perform their dynamic postural assessment, I actually grade them like they were in school. And anywhere where their body is moving out of alignment, I mark it down. From anywhere where they have a check mark or where they've had an imbalance, we take them through my method, the crane training method, which is a systematic programming process to quiet down and decrease the overactive tight muscles in our body and activate the weak dormant muscles in our body. So we first start this process through, it's a four-phase systematic programming process called the corrective exercise continuum. And each phase has a clear objective and goals for each phase. And as I take each client through each phase, the results are unbelievable from the before and after pictures that we take. Well, that's good news. So you've got a four-stage process. That's correct. Four phases of it. I love the phrase corrective exercise continuum. It sounds like space travel to me. <laughs> Is it that you can go back in time and correct the problems that have been caused by years of poor postural? I'm forgetting my words here. Help me out, Ryan. <laughs> uh, poor postural technique in their body is, is uh, in a posturally distorted position is the words I think you were attempting to find. Yes. Thank you. We need experts like you. We sort of know what we mean and we don't know how to put it into words. So each phase works in a systematic process. That's correct. Okay, so tell us more about that, Ryan. So it starts with the first phase is called inhibition. And in inhibition, we go through inhibitory techniques to decrease the overactive neuromyofascial tissues that are in the body. Okay, put this into small words, if you would, because these are words that you're used to using. Sure. What does that mean to me? Essentially, what it means is I am decreasing the tightness in your body through various massage techniques. And really what a lot of people use nowadays is what's called a foam roller. Most people are pretty familiar with. And the foam roller is the a main massage tool used in the first phase. And it's designed to decrease the tight spots in our body and enable our body to move in a pain-free range of motion. Okay, so the longer words that you were using then that I didn't understand, I know I've heard them, I assume that what you're saying is that you're, where it's sort of overactive, you go down all through the different layers of, you know, because we're all made up of different bits and layers, aren't we? Correct. Of muscles and tissues and softer bits and harder bits, but it's going down through all those levels, yeah? That's correct. Yeah. So, you know, the first phase of massage is essentially a, an analogy I use is with my clients is it's putting a fire out in your body. Think about what the firefighters do is their first objective is to put out the fire. 
And that's exactly the objective of massage, which is putting out the fire in your body so we can enable your muscles to increase in length and improve in range of motion. Right. Yes, that does make sense. The massage is putting out the fire so that you can begin the proper work, really. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Yep. Right. So what's the next phase then? The next phase is lengthening, and the objective of lengthening is to increase the length at all of our muscles and improve the range of motion. If we get back to the firefighter analogy, after the firemen have put out the fires, they then go in and clean up. And you can't clean up a fire until the fire is put out. So that's how you can see it's a systematic process where we first put out the fire with the inhibitory techniques of massage. Then we go into lengthen, and that's where we're increasing the length extensibility and range of motion of all those muscles and tissues in our body. And usually by this phase, people are experiencing drastic results from improved energy, improved productivity, and their technique and posture have improved immensely when we perform their postural assessment after performing these first two phases. Right. Well, one thing I do know, my limited knowledge, is that muscles really are what makes everything else work, aren't they? That's correct, yep. If there's tightness in our body, our muscles can't move optimally. They can't move optimally. They're moving out of alignment and they're taking the path of least resistance and then all sorts of uh, problems are uh, waiting for them. Right, okay. So it's lengthening the muscles, which improves the range of movement, makes it more efficient, and that's going to give us more energy, isn't it? It's going to give you more energy. It's common comment I get is, I now feel like I have the 20-pound weight vest off my back, and we've only done two phases. Okay. A gog is to know what the third phase is. Well, the first two phases are all designed around flexibility. Phase three and four are all designed around strength. So phase three is activation, and the main objective of activation is to strengthen the weak, underactive, or dormant muscles in our body that are not functioning because the overactive muscles are working too hard and the underactive muscles are asleep and not working at all. Right. So how do you do that? Uh, We do that through isolated strengthening. So essentially we'll focus on a part of the body that needs to activate and participate and come to the party. So we'll do that through various strengthening techniques to wake up muscles in the body that are asleep. Is this what you meant by, you mentioned neuromuscular control and neuromuscular efficiency? Yes, yes. So neuromuscular control and neuromuscular efficiency are starting to come in at phase three, but they're even more prevalent in phase four. Okay. I'm a poor accountant, Ryan, so... Explain this to me in words that I can understand. Sure. What do you mean by neuromuscular control and neuromuscular efficiency? In very simpler terms is neuromuscular efficiency is basically how your body moves as an integrated unit. It's enabling all of your muscles to work together, play nice, and play as a team. (laughs) Play nicely, play as a team. (laughs) I like that. Yes. And that's the control and the efficiency. It's working together as a unit. That's the objective of phase four, which is integration. And integration is teaching your body to work together and play nice. So this is the teamwork element then? Yep. You're getting those overactive tight muscles and underactive weak muscles to participate and work together. I see. So up to a certain point, if you've got a weaker team member, you can carry them And it won't show, but it does get to a certain point where that weaker team member has to raise the game because another team member is just working too hard and can't sustain it. Is that a good analogy? Exactly. Yeah, it's right. A strong team member needs a substitute and the substitute is that weak team member and that weak team member needs to participate. Okay, and you will... Do your detective work with your assessments uh, by watching the client move as well, by getting the background information, and then you will design a series of exercises to calm down that 
team member that's having to put in so much additional effort. That's correct. But at the same time, you're showing the weaker team member how they can raise their game. That's it. You hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. Fabulous, fabulous. You always have to explain things simply for us poor accountants, you know. (laughs) The key thing to remember is all of the training programs are not done blindly. They're all done from the background evaluation form and the results of the assessment. So I don't really, I can't know of what the program is going to look like until they come to me. I can have a guess from our initial phone call and the evaluation, but the most important pieces of the puzzle are the assessment. We are all different, but you're going to get people who are sitting at a desk all day. You're going to get kids who are hunched over computers all day. What can you share with us today that will help? What exercises can we do at home or sat at the desk or that we can teach our kids to stop some of those problems being formed? Uh, Well, I'll give you one kind of exercise in each phase, and they can be done with minimal equipment and a minimal amount of space. So we'll go through all four phases. And the first phase of inhibition, that's going to be massage. So we're going to use a massage tool. And I'm going to give you a nice creative one for a busy working professional. This exercise is grabbing a tennis ball and putting it in a tube sock, so a long you know, so- sport sock, and pushing the tennis ball all the way down to the base of the sock and then putting the tennis ball inside the sock and the sock behind your back and holding the tennis ball on a tender spot of your upper mid-back for 30 seconds. Okay, so let's just go through that again. Just take a tennis ball, push it right down to the bottom to the toe of a long sock. Correct. Okay, so anybody can carry those around with them. Uh, They can keep one in their office (laughs) desk at work, can't they? They can. So, And they then have to hold this. They put this between their back and their chair. Exactly. They sit back on their chair and they pause and hold for 30 seconds. So that's all you need to do. Hold it for 30 seconds. That's all you got to do. So there will be people listening to this that are thinking this through. So you hold the top of a long sock so you don't have to get your arm right behind you, do you? That's correct. And exactly whereabouts do we need it to be then on the upper back? Anywhere where there's a tight tender spot, usually not directly on the middle of the spine, usually on either side of the spine primarily in the scapula, which is kind of think of it as the two corners of the upper back, right below the base of the neck. Okay, so that's quite high up then, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah, so all you need to do is hold it for 30 seconds. Now, if somebody has tight spots on both sides, would they do one side for 30 seconds and then the other side for 30 seconds? You got it. Yep, that's correct. Fabulous, fabulous. So that has taken a minute. That's correct. And that is the first phase, which you called the inhibition phase. You got it. Now getting into lengthening, this is a terrific exercise for lower back pain. You can lay down on the ground on your back in the convenience of your own home or office and pull your right leg to your chest while keeping your left leg flat on the ground. Okay, so let's go through this slowly. So lying flat on the floor. That's correct. And when you say you pull your leg, do you do it with your knee? Or exactly. You pull your knee, which is bent, towards your chest, and you pause and hold that side for 30 seconds, and then you switch sides. Okay. And the other leg is flat on the floor while we're doing this? That's correct. Okay. Now, one of the things that does come up a lot when you're talking to people is don't do something that hurts, isn't it? Yeah, you want to stop at the first point of tension. But typically when people have lower back pain and they're lying down on their back, their back pain diminishes because their body is in alignment. And they're not putting any stress on the discs or the muscles in their back. Okay, so if they were to feel any pulling in their back, would they be able to lift the other leg, the one that they're not using? Would they be able to point their knee at the ceiling with a foot flat on the floor? Would that help? Yes, yeah. Typically at this phase, you want to stop at the first point of tension and hold that contraction for 30 seconds. Okay, so again, it's just 30 seconds. So... If somebody is able to leave, for example, we'll, we'll start with the right knee, leave the left leg flat on the floor, hold the right knee and just pull it towards the chest, stopping at the first point of tension. Correct. And hold for 30 seconds. Yeah, one point I'd like to address is I typically do two sets 
And the first set is for the client to understand how to execute it properly and to get the cobwebs off. The second set is where the client receives all the rewards and they actually feel the difference. They feel that they can pull their knee closer. They feel less tight. They feel an improved range of motion. Right. So the first one, I love that phrase. We're getting rid of the cobwebs. So do it once. Get rid of the cobwebs. We're just saying, okay, this is what we want to do. And then the second time, you can perhaps hug it a little bit more. That's correct. Okay. And then so we do one, then repeat, and then we put that leg down and we do the other leg. And we just, again, we blow the cobwebs away on the first time. And then the second time, we increase that hug slightly, but always still stopping at the first point of tension. You got it. That's correct. Okay. So, again, that has just taken a couple of minutes, hasn't it? That's correct. And this is really where the client is saying, hey, wow, I actually really feel better. Mm, good, good, good. I've got less pain, more energy and improved range of motion and less tightness in their body. Yes. Again, a lot of people will say that constant pain really saps your energy, doesn't it? It totally does. Yeah. So just these little, little movements. And we've spent so far three minutes doing phase one and phase two. So what, what do we do in phase three, Ryan? Phase three is now all designed around strength. So we're going to perform an exercise called the floor bridge. And to do this, you're going to first get down on the ground and lay on your back with your knees bent and your feet facing forward and your arms down at your side. Okay, so arms down by your side, feet flat on the floor, mm -hmm. knees up, and again, I assume that everything is going to be facing forwards in the same direction. That's correct. And nice and lined up. That's correct. Knees bent. Okay. Correct. When ready, you are going to elevate your pelvis into the air, and you're going to hold that contraction for two seconds, and then you're going to come down slowly in four seconds. Okay. Take us through that again, Ryan. So when ready... You're in alignment. You are going to elevate your butt or your pelvis off the ground, and you are going to hold it, hold the contraction at the top for two seconds. After you have held it for two seconds, you are going to bring your butt down to the floor in a slow and controlled manner, preferably in a four-second deceleration. Okay, so again, we will stop at the first point of tension, I assume. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Everybody is going to be different, but how much are we trying to raise our butt off the floor? We want to raise it high enough, but not too far enough where we're placing our body in, or our lower back into an arch. Okay, so just take it off the ground is going to do something then. That's correct. Yeah, because this is one of the very similar to a yoga posture that's often used to help with back pain. Yeah, that's correct. And when you raise your butt upward, you're going to squeeze your glutes, which are your butt muscles, and you will feel a contraction in your lower back. And that's an exercise to strengthen the muscles and the discs in the lower back. So this is a strengthening muscle for the muscles in your backside and the lower back. Correct. You got it. Fabulous. And again, it's just going to be up very, very slowly and gently and if all you're doing is just taking your bottom off the ground that's enough isn't it that's correct and we want to do one to two sets of 10 to 15 repetitions and remember slow and controlled tempo okay so you said hold it for two seconds and take four seconds going back down to the ground you got it okay and how many repetitions again ryan 10 to 15 reps for one to two sets 10 to 15 repetitions now do we always do phases one, two, and three together? So we always start off with the tennis ball and then the hugging the knee to the chest before we do this? Look at it this way. Let me give you another analogy because I use a lot of analogies in my practice. Think of what we're doing as a staircase. If we jump to phase three without doing phase one and two, we've just skipped the first four steps of the staircase. So you can see how we're skipping steps. And, you know, I do a little bit of work with very accomplished athletes, and they need just as much work in phase one and two as the office worker or elder who's deconditioned. So it's a systematic programming process. We all start at the bottom of the staircase and we move upward in a slow and controlled manner. Okay, so it is always slow and controlled and we always start with step one. Thank you. I think we're up to the fourth step now, right? 
Yep, the fourth phase is integration, and this is, again, teaching your body to work together and play nice. And there's so many different exercises that can come in here, but I'm going to choose a, a pretty basic and generic one, and it's going to be uh, balance training, and we'll call it the single leg balance. And essentially what we're doing here is we're having all of our weight on our right leg with our foot facing forward, and our left leg off the ground and holding that for 30 seconds. Okay, now we're all very different. As I say, I'm just a poor, simple accountant. How do I lift my foot off the ground? Do I point it? Do I lift it forward? Do I take it back? Do I just bend my knee slightly so it comes off the floor? Well, we can get the leg moving in different planes of motion and in different directions. But for this exercise and today, we're going to have all of our weight on our right leg. We're going to have our left leg off the ground and have it adjacent to our right leg without touching and by also having it off the ground. So your leg can be straight or bent. Right. But the easiest thing if people just, um, and I'm doing it now as we speak, Ryan, I am standing and I am putting all my weight onto my right leg and I am just lifting my left foot slightly off the floor. And I actually use my knee really and held my foot straight just so it's two inches off the ground. Okay. That's great. You want to make sure that you're standing up tall, uh, your shoulders are pulled back, and your head is looking forward. Okay. Again, everything facing in the same direction. That's correct. That's something that's very easy for people to remember. If everything is facing in the same direction, we're not putting strain on some, somewhere where we shouldn't, are we? That's correct. So we stand tall, straight, everything facing in the same direction. We transfer weight to one side to one foot, one leg. We're still facing all in the same direction and we just lift the other leg slightly off the floor. That's all we need to do. That's correct. How long do we hold that? How long do we hold that, Ryan? We're going to hold that for 30 seconds and we're going to do one to two sets on each leg. Now, I think I remember reading that it can help balance if you find a fixed point to look at. It can. Uh, it definitely can help an individual find a fixed point to look at. Okay, so... Just find something on the wall. Keep your gaze fixed on that. You're standing straight, tall, everything facing in the same direction. Transfer weight onto one side and then just gently, slowly lift the other foot off the floor and hold for 30 seconds. That's it. You got it. And what is this actually doing, Ryan? Uh, here we're actually strengthening a variety of muscles at once. We're getting strength in our foot and ankle. We're strengthening that leg that we're standing on. Uh, we're strengthening our lower back. We're strengthening our abdominals. And we're strengthening all of the muscles in our hips, which provide dynamic stability to our lower back. So this is what you mean by everyone playing nicely together. Because I've got your foot working, I've got your knee working, I've got all the muscles in your legs, hips, hamstrings, quads working, as well as the core and low back uh, working as well. So all the muscles are working together. Do you know what just struck me then, Ryan? When we move, we really don't know what's involved, do we? Most people have no idea. Yeah, I mean, you obviously do. Most people don't until we have somebody like you who tells us what is actually going on in the body. I had no idea how many muscles were coming into play. And we're using the word play again because it's everything playing nicely together, isn't it? You got it. Yeah, that's fabulous. Um, you know what strikes me, Ryan, that these four things that you've just given us, how simple they are to do how quick how easy well the best of all is they can be done anywhere with no equipment and that's what people need in in this fast-paced moving environment where people have less time yes less time we can't all get to a gym every day we can't all you know do the things that we want to do and the things that we intend to do but something like these four exercises. Can we just recap then, Ryan, and go through? So we're talking about a sock with a, a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. A sock with a tennis ball on our upper back. And we just find a little point of tension and we hold it against the back of the chair. For 30 seconds and then switch sides. For 30 seconds and switch sides. The next, the second phase. Which is lengthening. You're going to lie down on your back and bend one leg and pull it to your chest while having the other leg extended on the ground. 
Okay, so it's hugging that knee to the chest, isn't it? First one to blow the cobwebs away, the second one is more of a hug, isn't it? That's correct. And then the third one was tilting the pelvis slightly. Mm -hmm. The third one is an activation exercise, which is designed to strengthen the lower back. So you're going to lay down on your back, knees bent, facing forward, raise your butt off the ground, hold the contraction at the apex for two seconds, come down in four seconds, nice and slow, perform one to two sets of 10 to 15 repetitions. And then the final one is bringing everything together. And that's a single leg balance exercise and you're going to put all your weight on your right leg while having your left leg off the ground and this is going to teach the entire body to play nice get those tight muscles and weak muscles to work together and the important thing to remember here is even if you're an athlete you do steps one two three and four in order that's correct that we all need to start on the bottom step that's it. You got it. Ryan, again, I am struck by the simplicity of those four exercises and that they can be done pretty well anywhere, anytime, can't they? That's correct. So would you suggest that first thing in the morning, perhaps somebody during the lunch break when they get home before they go to bed, are those times appropriate? Yeah, really whenever is convenient for their schedules. Yes, but you can pretty much do them at any time. Okay. And they're not going to take long at all are they ryan what else would you say i mean our listeners are people who are suffering from back pain one of the things that, that does strike me is i'm going back again to that you could have a problem with your foot and it's causing back pain what would you say to the people listening today i want to give people hope and there is a solution for their for their pain particularly if it's lower back pain i want to give people a solution and essential strategies to cope with their with their pain and you know i think a lot of people lose confidence lose hope and often can get depressed from persistent pain and this can be pain from anywhere really can't it because you're saying that a weakness in one area can cause a problem in another area. Now, to my limited understanding, if you're causing a problem in one area, surely that means that another team member somewhere else is going to have to compensate. So you can end up just storing up a load of problems in the body. Is that right? You got it. That's correct. So it really doesn't matter if somebody comes to you with a knee problem or a shoulder problem or a back problem. You're still doing the same thing, really, aren't you? Trying to put everything back into balance. You got it. That's correct. Putting everything back into balance so the whole body can work together and be a strong and efficient team. Strong and efficient team. I do love the analogy of playing nicely together. Yes. Ryan, if people want to learn more about what you do, where would they go? They can go to a variety of places. They can first go to my website, which is uh, www.ryancrane.com. That's R-Y-A-N, Crane with a K, R-A-N-E.com. So Ryan, R-Y-A-N, Crane, K-R-A-N-E.com. They can first go there and navigate through my website. They also can sign up for my pain-free living tips newsletter, and you can sign up anywhere on my website. And I share some of my corrective exercise secrets there, and it's a free publication that comes out every week. Brian, I know that you're very busy, and I can't keep you for too much longer, but could we just finish by perhaps you sharing some stories of the people that you've worked with in the past. Sure, there's a ton of stories that I could share. Probably the most recent one is a gentleman who has suffered from an assortment of injuries. I would relate it to his car being totaled. And he came to see me and he had appointments with a pain specialist, with an orthopedic surgeon, a chiropractor and a physical therapist. And after one session, he left with a tremendous amount of hope that his pain in all of his body was going to subside by following the systematic programming process of the corrective exercise continuum. That's brilliant. I mean, just if you may, obviously we're not giving any names here, but what exercises did you give him to do? Uh, I gave him initial appointment after doing the assessment. We gave him an exercise in each of the four phases. Uh, the inhibition phase, the lengthening, the activation, and the integration phase. So it was still only four 
steps. Only four steps. Now, in our first session, we really only did the first two steps. We didn't get to step three and four because his body was not ready for it. Okay, because you actually said that you would have, have likened him to a total car wreck, a write-off. Yeah, he was not ready. People like that are not ready for phases three and four for usually two to four weeks. They need about three to five sessions of phase one and two before I introduce phase three. But we got drastic results in phase one and two. Well, that's good to know, isn't it? Yeah. And again, that's bringing out the point that you always start with step one. That's correct. We always start at the bottom. That's the foundation and it's the frame. Yeah. So even somebody as bad as that who cannot get to step three at that time, you can still do steps one and two. And I think that's an important thing to bring out here, isn't it? That even if you can only do steps one and two, it'll still help. That's correct. He's had drastic results only going through phase one and two. And I love the way that you said that he went out with hope that he presumably was close to depression if it was that bad. He enjoyed it so much and he had so much hope that he canceled the appointment with the pain specialist and the orthopedic surgeon. Oh, wow. And that was after one appointment. After one appointment. That's fabulous, isn't it? Well, Ryan, that is wonderful. That's what we're trying to do with this tennis summit, give people hope that they don't have to put up with the pain, that there is always something that they can do, even if it's only very small steps in the beginning. That's correct. Well, I think probably that's a good point to tie things up. Ryan, thank you very much for spending the time with us today, for sharing those four simple but effective phases with us and for letting us know that even if we can only start on the very first two steps, that by carrying on, by doing those steps in order, that there is help and hope for the future. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Ryan, thank you very much indeed. Indeed.